Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man in 2020. Can you believe it? It's already 2020. In fact, it's already the end of the first week of 2020. Even this year is starting to go by fast. I'd like to wish all of you a happy new year from here at ThinkTech Hawaii and our brand new studios. Thanks to Jay Fidel and the crew here at ThinkTech. We have some brand new digs to broadcast from, and we're hoping that the, the quality and everything will be even better than it was before. And uh, of course, we already have high quality hosts and guests, so we've got that square filled. And speaking of high quality hosts and guests, we have a great guest today to start off the year, uh, Lorena Kiba, who uh, has been in the energy world here in Hawaii for quite a while. And I met her when she was on the Public Utilities Commission, and she came out to Hickam to see our hydrogen station. And uh, she's uh, since moved on to be doing some consulting. And so, Lorraine, I'll let you fill in from there. And uh, welcome to the show. And just tell the viewers a little bit about yourself and your background and how you came to know the, the ugly old general here. Aloha, Stan. Thank you again for inviting me to be part of your show on Think Tech Hawaii and love the new studio as well. So uh, everybody has to, you know, pay attention to the 2020 new year ahead with all the exciting program lineup. But I uh, came to know Stan, as he said, as part of my uh, duties and network of, uh, of uh, industry stakeholders that Stan represented uh, in, in um in the hydrogen area and the renewable transportation, alternative transportation fuels. Uh, when I was at the Public Utilities Commission, I was appointed by Governor Neil Abercrombie in 20, uh, July 2012 and served uh, my full term for six years until uh, June 30, 2018. So it hasn't been too long since I've been a commissioner and I continue to be very actively involved in the um, energy ecosystem, not only in Hawaii, but also nationally and internationally representing clients uh, through my new company, LHA Ventures, where I'm a senior policy advisor on energy and regulatory policy matters. Uh, so there is a lot happening in the uh, hydrogen area, and renewable hydrogen is a very important part of that. So, Stan, you've been leading on that, and I'm, I'm really glad to be able to contribute today with, uh, with my little bit of mana'o and uh, experience here and add some new information from my uh, travels and the work that I've been doing since I left the commission. I think the other area that's really important too uh, is, is microgrids for resiliency and, and Hawaii of course is leading the way with that, uh, with uh, you know the, the pending docket. So maybe I'll turn it over to you to let you uh, tell uh, uh, me what you want me to uh, address and, and talk more about for our listeners. Okay, well, first of all, um, let's talk a little bit about the PUC and could I ask you uh, frankly, what you see the the role of the PUC, what the most critical role of the PUC is going to be this year in terms of maybe guiding policy, um, supporting legislation, or, or at least, you know, what legislation you're kind of looking for um, out of the, the state government to, to kind of give the PUC direction on getting to 2045 and the renewable energy uh, goals that we have for the state. Yeah, even though the PUC is, is a regulatory body and, and basically, they, uh, you know, as commissioners, we function as administrative law judges and on docket matters. Some of them are contested, some are not, some are information gathering dockets, and that's really a critical aspect as well of what the Public Utilities Commission does. People don't realize that because they think it's just the legislature that does the policy. Well, the legislature sets up a, a framework for policy and a regulatory framework, but it's really the PUC that's given the task of actually implementing that and getting the the work done and helping the utilities as well as the uh, industry stakeholders as well as our community um, and the customers in, involved in our energy ecosystem achieve the outcomes that uh, we all want to to see and also move us forward to that 100% renewable energy future and 100% decarbonization which is not just the energy sector but transportation and other sectors water uh, that uh, we have ambitious goals for in, in Hawaii I think the big challenge for the PUC has always been uh, continued resources. It's a small but mighty uh, commission. I've always been proud of that. Uh, we have working commissioners. When I was a commissioner, worked hard on orders and you know, um, getting up to speed on a lot of the information that comes before commissioners. I think the challenge, though, is really dealing with um, some of the um, uh, external drivers that sometimes can um, uh, help transformation, but also can also be disruptive forces that need to uh, be used for positive change. 
the biggest thing that the PUC is really dealing with uh, this next short uh, term period is really the performance-based regulation, getting that in place so that the utilities can begin to, again, transform their business models, really become um, the utility of the future, not so much focused on selling kilowatt hours of electricity. They're all, I mean, for Ho the Hawaiian Electric Company needs, they're already decoupled. And uh, really uh, seeing new, new ways to help customers uh, uh, achieve energy savings and low cost energy, but also achieve the 100% renewable uh, goal. And that can be including larger customers and behind the meter resources. So it takes a lot of collaboration, a lot of coordination, a lot of work in terms of grid modernization. So there's many open dockets where these are like multiple balls being juggled in the air, multiple things. We, I talked about microgrid uh, uh, tariff docket. That's a very important docket in terms of not only resiliency and, and providing microgrids as we see uh, can be done in places like Puerto Rico and other island grids where we're facing the threats of climate change and climate impacts like hurricanes and tropical storms and, you know, rain bombs and just uh, severe wildfires even uh, within our own state, um, but also in terms of integrating new technology, whether that's energy storage, and, and that's where hydrogen plays a role, you know, in terms of a new technology for long duration storage beyond lithium ion batteries. So as far as Hawaiian Electric goes, um, do you get the feeling that they've really embraced the concept of uh, distributed generation and microgrids and, uh, and those concepts as they look towards 2045? Or is, is that something where all of us have to really kind of, kind of get them out of their comfort zone and push them away from their existing grid structure and into something that's a little bit more um, supportive of sustainability and renewable energy? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the thing about uh, Hawaii is we all want to get to the same place, but, you know, devil's in the details. I think we all agree we want to get to 100% renewable. We want to be a, a fully decarbonized uh, in, uh, ecosystem here. But, you know, how do you get there? And, and what's important? What do you prioritize? And that's where we have disagreements and, and we have a lot of passionate dialogue in Hawaii. Uh, but it does take everybody rowing in the canoe. I've always used that analogy. So we can't just rely on the utility. Customers, I think, have to play their role. And whether that's larger customers that can help build microgrids, own microgrids, contribute with their resources so that the utility can uh, spend its um, uh, capital uh, assets on the grid modernization that's required and, and the overall uh, changes that need to be made to transform the transmission and distribution system. So I think it is important and you know, it, it's hard to embrace change. I, I think uh, people are always concerned about, you know, unintended consequences, but if we don't take those steps and if we don't uh, go forward, we'll never get there. I think it's trying to inject into um, uh, the utility culture that, that Silicon Valley kind of DNA, fail fast, learn quick. And that's really hard because in the past, utilities weren't rewarded for taking risks. They weren't rewarded for, uh, you know, uh, experimenting and, and being a, a little bit outside of the box. I mean, it's 100% reliability and the old regulatory system didn't reward that. So that's why performance-based regulation is a key to that change where we're going to focus on outcomes, not necessarily just uh, the traditional cost of uh, service uh, reimbursements and, and regulatory framework. Yeah, that's that's uh, something I see happening now. Is that um, they they uh, my electric bill when it comes, it just has a kilowatt uh, hour charge, but it doesn't charge separately for infrastructure. And in reality, um, if we start seeing a lot of people migrating away from the grid, that puts a big infrastructure bill to the utility that then has to be shared with less and less uh, customers. And that drives the power, uh, the electric bill overall higher. So I, I think kind of getting them to see new pictures and like you say, it, maybe we should try stuff, uh, try fast, fail fast and, and move on to the better models. But uh, I, I think it's really tough for an established um, monopoly utility to think out of the box, to be risk takers. And quite frankly, going back to the PUC, uh, sometimes the PUC was... Uh, actually risk averse itself and, and not really open to letting uh, utility companies take a lot of risk, um, especially yeah. if it would impact the customers. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that was a, a definitely uh, historically, that's how, you know, quote unquote, economic regulators um, view their jobs. 
But I have to say, I mean, and maybe it was during my tenure, uh, you know, when I was there with uh, uh, Chair Mina Morita and uh, fellow Commissioner Mike Champley, we were, you know, very proactive. I think uh, the current commission under Chair Griffin still cites our white paper inclination uh, on Hawaii's utilities of the future, which set forth a strategic roadmap. And we actually gave that very gentle nudge. If some people thought it was a gentle nudge. Uh, other people may have thought it was kind of a kick in the pants. I don't know. But it basically laid out the changes that need to be made uh, by the utility. And it is really um, leaving some of that status quo that is a barrier behind and trying new things like perhaps trying new things like uh, what you always talk about on your show, Stan. Let's look at renewable hydrogen. Let's look at hydrogen fuel cell technology paired with renewables so that we can uh, have a really diverse portfolio of tools in the toolkit to get to 100%. It's not just going to be large scale uh, solar, wind, or, uh, you know, although we're blessed with abundant uh, natural resources here, whether it's geothermal, wind, we can do a pump hydro in places like Kauai. Um, we have to look at alternative uh, technologies and, and also the developments that are happening with renewable hydrogen, especially as we have more excess renewables or curtailing solar and wind. And instead of throwing that valuable renewable energy away, we should be using that to make uh, renewable hydrogen, which can have many uses in other industries, in the aviation industry, so we can have, uh, you know, reduced carbon uh, uh, air, uh, airline fuel is a sustainable air, aviation fuel. Hydrogen is a very important pro, uh, product of that. And then uh, byproducts that people use in industrial processes, whether it's ammonia, other products that can be used in industrial processes that uh, are good byproducts in that and instead of throwing that away. And it's renewable hydrogen, so it doesn't have a carbon footprint. And it can, with hydrogen fuel cell technology developments, provide the long duration storage that lithium ion batteries don't provide right now and can help us with resilient strategies. You know, it's really um, very frightening. I think if we saw in the news today, Puerto Rico suffered another, uh, there was an earthquake and there's severe yeah. damage um, to Puerto Rico. They're just getting back on their feet after Hurricane Maria. Yeah, island grids are so vulnerable. And, um, you know, to its credit, the city and county of Honolulu. Um, uh, you know, Office of uh, Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency, which I sit on their steering committee, uh, the Strategic Steering Committee for that, put together a very uh, ambitious resilient strategy action plan. And part of that is having community resilience hubs, which are microgrids, using renewable energy, uh, looking at renewables perhaps being harvested from methane and other, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emission emitters from wastewater treatment plants and landfills that we now just let go into the air. So it's, you know, it's, it is a coordinated um, approach. It's not just the energy sector, but it's other sectors as well. But it does take leadership. And I know the PUC has to play its role uh, when the change is not fast enough or the movement is not fast enough. It's up to the PUC to hold the utilities accountable. And I, I'm confident that, uh, uh, that they will do that. Well, you, you mentioned um, the, uh, the fact that hydrogen energy storage is gonna become critical. Uh, you know, I think people fail to realize how energy dense fossil fuels are. And we take it for granted that not only are they inexpensive right now, whether it's natural gas or oil, they're relatively inexpensive, but they also store a tremendous amount of energy. And so Hawaiian Electric right now counts on quite a bit of fossil fuel, either unstored on island here or in the pipeline on ships coming to the island to guarantee us the service that we require, which is uninterrupted, high quality electrical power. But how are we gonna to transition to that volume of energy storage? Um, we're certainly not gonna do it with just batteries. So mm -hmm. maybe uh, we'll take a, a quick break here, uh, short, short, shortly and come back and talk a little bit, uh, like you said, on microgrids and energy storage and how Maybe Hawaiian Electric needs to look at a, a, a little different change in how they distribute energy and how they take energy on the grid and store it and put it back on the grid at the point of uh, manufacture, as it were, with solar energy. We'll be back in uh, 60 seconds and we'll talk to Lorraine more about that. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And I'm the host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy, we're on every Wednesday at four o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to 
the windmills, the hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at four o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Hi guys, I'm your host Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you, and uh, aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here, and I'm talking to Lorena Kiba, a former um, commissioner at the PUC and a longtime energy advocate here in the state of Hawaii for clean energy. And uh, we're just getting ready to talk about energy storage, Mina. I uh, mean, not Mina. I'm sitting here transferring you over to Mina Marita, uh, another, well, another I did serve with clean Mina. energy advocate. <laughs> we were talking about her. Yeah, we were talking about her during good the break. company. I'm getting old, and this is one of my pitfalls of getting old is I, I keep doing that. But, um, you know, you and Mina both worked hard to uh, advocate for clean energy and hydrogen. I mean, I look back at some of the Think Tech shows and some of the um, OC16 shows that Mina Marita was on where yeah. she was talking about hydrogen. And I still talk to her and say, how come we couldn't get it going, you know, like 10, 12, 15 years ago? And she's, she was pretty frustrated too. But you seem to have gotten the hydrogen bug as well. And how, what role well, do you really see hydrogen playing as we start to try and meet this 2045 goal? Well, you know, everything in, in life, uh, Stan, is really timing. And while that, you know, there was a lot of potential before for, you know, for hydrogen, now with the, the, the dynamics that exist now, uh, it's, uh, you know, the push for 100% renewable, push for 100% decarbonization, not only in Hawaii, but across the United States and, and, and globally. So you've got California, which is leading. Uh, we kind of, you know, take turns between who's going to be the leading state we led on 100% renewable and uh, you know decarbonization, and now they're actually leading in terms of trying to realize those uh, outcomes with a lot of large volume. And they they led on energy storage, which helped drive the prices down for everybody. But really, that's what it is. It's the factors that this that all these different factors are kind of aligning so that it's creating a, a very ideal market situation. Because you have to have a market, you also have to have large scale volume to drive the demand. So prices can come down for the technology. There's been improvements in the hydrogen technology, whether that's on the electrolyzers or on the hydrogen fuel cell technology, the battery, the, you know, the long duration energy storage. It's, it's like a battery, basically, when I think about it. But, you know, the hydrogen fuel cell technology, new advances that have um, uh, made the cost come down as well. So it's all these different um, changes and transformations that are coming together to drive the ideal market situation. And then as different key players in that who are interested in hydrogen, and there are international players, whether that's Australia that really sees renewable hydrogen and hydrogen as an export product for their country, uh, South Korea that has need for hydrogen because of uh, their uh, a growing uh, you know, economy and they, they want to commit to their uh, goals to abide by uh, you know, the Paris Climate Accords to reduce their carbon footprint. Japan, which has been constrained because of the nuclear uh, plants that are not able to come back online and, and they want to find replacements for, for both coal and more expensive uh, natural gas or constrained supplies of natural gas. So hydrogen is, is playing, renewable hydrogen is playing into that now and especially as we have more renewables on the grid in various states and it's in the western states good wind resources good solar resources that are being wasted so what do you do with that excess energy so in fact there's a big project in california the intermountain uh, uh, power uh, project it's actually based in utah but it's a project being done by uh, LADWP, which is a municipal utility, a big, huge municipal utility that serves the Los Angeles area. Um, they, they are just an electric utility. They're looking at this as a, as a way to convert an oil coal plant into uh, initially uh, a renewable hydrogen and gas, and then uh, eventually totally able to run on renewable hydrogen. And it's based in Utah, where they have a salt dome, where they can do a lot of uh, hydrogen storage there. 
So figuring out new solutions, but everything's coming together because, as I said, the market forces are lining up as they didn't do before, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And we have a lot of good, cheap, excess renewable energy that can be utilized to make renewable hydrogen. That is the big difference, along with the technology improvements that have driven costs down. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Lorraine. Um, the cost is coming down. In fact, I, I just reviewed a show that I did last year or around a year ago with Plug Power, Andy Marsh from Plug Power, who's probably one of the few hydrogen focused companies that is in the black. And he was in the red for years and years. And he said the exact same thing. He said, Stan, the, it's the timing and the market is there. The supply is here and the demand is coming up and things are just moving towards 2020 being the year of hydrogen. And, you know, I can see that, um, the, the, right now, Hawaiian Electric is actually unable to bring more solar on in certain parts of their structure because they can't accept it. It, it destabilizes their grid too much. And the mm -hmm. answer is you could take more if you could take that excess solar yeah. and store yeah. it. And storing right. it in hydrogen makes a whole lot of sense. So when it comes to building these microgrids and maybe building communities that are more focused on dispatchable power from solar, um, how would Hawaiian Electric, you know, what, what's your vision for Hawaiian Electric trying to structure themselves to take advantage of that? Yeah, you know, I think they're in the, in the perfect place right now. And I've always, you know, when I was a commissioner and, and now even as I've been off the commission, I really, I've really encouraged them, you know, to find new revenue opportunities. It's not the sale of, you know, of the widget of kilowatt hours of electricity. Really the new role for the utility is the energy services manager for customers, whether that's residential customers, large customers, but all their customers um, that they serve in, in, in their service territory. They should be the trusted advisor to help get the best low cost energy, the best mix of resources to deliver energy to their customers. And that means looking at new ways to do that. And I think with the, with the, the retirement of fossil fuel baseload, I think people don't realize, I know you do sad because you know the science of it, but you know, thermal baseload is, is, is needed to balance out the system. And so because of the nature, intermittent nature of solar and wind, it's important to have that base load to be able to wrap up back, you know, quickly and be able to be there for backup should uh, some of the other units on the system go down quickly. So that's been the role of thermal base load units. Um, and we don't have any natural gas here, so we use those steam turbines, which are very inefficient. But if we had renewable hydrogen and we have uh, plants that can use that and in new turbines that are in uh, uh, the electric plants of the future, I think um, Siemens and General Electric are producing uh, turbines that can run on, on renewable hydrogen yeah. fuel. Again, because of the, the market that's being driven in California by the utilities in California to get off of fossil fuel and yet have a, a renewable uh, thermal base load replacement, these market developments are happening. So I think with planned communities and where we have our growth areas, whether that's on Maui or that's in, um, you know, Oahu, West Oahu, where the population still keeps growing, we need reliable power there. And um, a microgrid can help uh, achieve that, uh, not only because of resilience concerns, because of hurricanes coming through. And if the whole island goes down, at least you can island off certain pockets where key uh, population centers are, where we can have first responders or we can have food, emergency, things can stay running. That was the problem in Puerto Rico, right? When the grid went down, there was no place to even have, uh, you know, store your insulin if you're a diabetic, go right. for kidney dialysis. And if we're getting off of, of fossil fuel, the hospitals need, you know, they still have diesel gen sets as backup. So hydrogen fuel te technology on the mainland, again, in California is being used. And in the East Coast, because of the uh, experience with Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy, they have many places, many hospitals have replaced their diesel gen sets with, uh, you know, hydrogen fuel cell technology. Um, and, you know, our, our, those are long duration um, storage units that should the hospital power go down, they can, they can use that as backup power. And they're not diesel gen sets, so they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, pollution or concerns uh, uh, in terms of climate impacts. So those are some real examples where in a microgrid, a planned microgrid, uh, you can use all these different renewable energy resources as part of a toolkit. And that's right. exactly and what I think you know, is you important. Know, something, something else that you mentioned earlier was uh, with, with the technology improvements, 
You also mentioned byproducts. One of the things that people don't appreciate is as we scale hydrogen production up on, uh, say, a microgrid that has a lot of solar and they're curtailing power, you actually produce the three things with an electrolyzer. You produce the hydrogen to store the energy, but you also produce medical grade oxygen, which on an island becomes critical mm -hmm. in an emergency. You also mm -hmm. produce heat. So there's a limited amount of heat that you that you actually can turn back into more electricity. You don't get a, a real, um, there's a big, big kick on small scale hydrogen, but when you get to larger scale hydrogen, there's enough heat to uh, do a combined heat and power uh, application on a microgrid to actually make it even more, a, a more economic um, uh, model for a microgrid. So, and, and also sustainability. As you mentioned, during an emergency, you're, you know, it's very rare that an entire, like an entire island or an entire island chain would go down completely unless it was a really mega disaster. You're always gonna have pockets of residual surviving uh, microgrids that could be providing the ice and the refrigeration and things that you need to get the rest of your society back up online. So, you know, I, um, I think, yeah. Lorraine, we, we've got there. about uh, about a minute or two minutes left. Uh -huh. and, and if you'd mm -hmm. like, why don't you just wrap us up here and, and give us your thoughts sure. in the last two minutes. Sure. I think that I, I want to make sure people know that this is not just, you know, some pie in the sky dream. These things are happening and I can rattle off in the next, you know, 60 seconds and talk real fast. All the different examples of successful microgrids that have been installed across the country, across the world. I mean, when we talk about a, you know, a, a microgrid in terms of a, a, a a clean energy innovation hub in a city uh, complex. We, we both know about Australia and the Australia Renewable uh, Energy Agency worked with ATCO, which is uh, Western Australia's big gas company, to put in a clean energy microgrid with hydrogen, with renewable energy, using the synergy of both. Uh, we've got Kane that did the Marcus Garvey Village uh, 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 microgrid, which was to address resiliency as well as and avoid some expensive transmission upgrades for a low-income community uh, to uh, ensure reliable power, not only for that for that uh, uh, community, but also for the rest of the customers in Con Ed service territory. And it actually benefited everybody because of, of avoiding expensive transmission costs. And Puerto Rico, as we know, uh, you know, coming out of Hurricane Maria has, was the first out to establish microgrid regulations so that uh, their communities and cities, especially the isolated communities could have microgrids um, and, and rebuild uh, on a microgrid. Uh, and I know in Alaska, uh, they're, they're doing more microgrids as well uh, in partnership with, um, uh, with the Department of Energy. So these are not, uh, you know, science projects. They've actually implemented, they're proving uh, economic uh, benefits and their uh, solutions for the future. So I think microgrids, resiliency, sustainability, and renewable hydrogen in that mix is a reality that we're gonna see more actions uh, going forward in the in the new decade. All right, Lorraine, and, and I appreciate you coming on the, on the show today with uh, a positive slant on hydrogen. You know, that makes me feel good. But uh, I wanna to add to your list, uh, HCAT just broke ground on their microgrid at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam uh, while we're on our break here at ThinkTech. And that grid should be up and running within within this year. So that'll be a local example of a microgrid that we can both go look at. And I'm sure I can get you out there to take a tour of it. We'll do that. So thanks again for being on the show. And uh, until Thank next you. week, we're all, I'm going to try and do a show next week on um, microgrids and why we should be moving to them and give you some examples of, of the logic of moving to microgrids. So until next week, this is Stan Enerby, J-Man, signing off. And uh, thanks again to Lorena Kiva for being my guest. Aloha.